Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. The Apostle Paul wrote, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? Let us dwell together in peace, and let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken, may only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. Well, so uh, the question keeps uh, being asked, are you growing a beard? <laughs> the answer is, I'm not shaving. We'll see what comes of that. We'll see what comes of that. Well, you know, it's Movember, which I, when I first heard about it, got excited about. It, but it's not the sort of Mo that I thought it was. It's uh, Movember is the No Shave no November, and it's when people uh, let themselves go a bit uh, in solidarity with those who lose their hair because of cancer treatments. Uh, 
And so uh, I have never, uh, though, you know, inwardly very butch, I've never let it <laughs> be expressed, you see. I said that wearing a caftan, hello. But yeah, I've never, uh, I've just never. And so uh, it's, it's very uncomfortable. It grows more on this side than this side. It comes out totally white. I'm, uh, I'm not loving it at all, but um, there you have it. Uh, so the answer is I'm, I'm not shaving. So um, we do what we can. Well, in the year 29, lots of people didn't shave. How's that for a segue? You could ride that one on the beach. Um, the year 29, very important year, because that is the year that Jesus was executed. Born in 4 BCE, executed in 29 CE or AD, Anno Domini. And so uh, in 29, he was, he was killed. And that should have been the end, really. That should have been the end of his influence and certainly the end of his movement. But miraculously, it wasn't. His friends insisted that they were still in contact with him. They saw him at Golgotha. They saw him be executed. He was tortured to death. And yet they're saying, every once in a while he shows up for breakfast. That they see him out and about. That he's in, he's in a garden and he's on the beach and they just bump into him sometimes. But they experienced him and then they told about it. They experienced him and felt him guiding them somehow. And so they talked with him. They had ritual meals remembering him. They told stories about him. They told their friends that he wasn't dead, not to them, that they were still actively involved with this person that Rome killed. He in some way had survived his execution and was still with them. The story of Jesus' resurrection was a great encouragement to people who were hurt and scared and beaten down. The empire had vast power, all power. It was the only superpower on earth. It was the greatest empire the world had ever seen. It was invincible. It had all the power. And yet, for all of its might, the worst they could do is kill you. And now they have a story that says that might not take. That death isn't the end of the story. That even living in an occupied territory, these people could find a sense of freedom and liberation. Yes, Rome can march in here and take our land, but they cannot colonize our souls. They can't take our sacred value. The worst they can do is kill us and we might not stay dead, you know, because resurrection. So that was encouraging. That was empowering. That gave life to a movement that should have died in 29. But it didn't. The story of the resurrection let people remember what Jesus said, that to God, all are alive. That God was the God of Abraham and Sarah. God was the God of the ancestors. And so if God, present tense, is the God of the ancestors, the ancestors must not be dead. That is, that, that is what Jesus said. And so if, if God is the God of the ancestors, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. So if God is the God of the ancestors, the ancestors can't be dead. They still live somehow in God. And the resurrection then is saying, See, Jesus got it right. He knew what he was talking about because he's still with us somehow. And if he's still with us, what else is possible? To God, all are alive. So Jesus isn't dead. And if he's not dead, he can still guide us. And if he can still guide us, we can still do what we've been doing. Resurrection means the story's not finished and we are actually the ones to continue writing it. And that got people through a very difficult time. Jesus in stories and Jesus in ritual feasts and Jesus in our imaginations. It's like he's still here. And so people started wondering if Jesus is still here in all of these ways, wonder if he might not just show up in a physical way. Maybe he'll just come back and set up shop, set up an address right here again. Because there was, again, precedent for that. The, uh, Elijah uh, supposedly didn't die. The story says that he was caught up in a whirlwind and, and taken to the great beyond. So he never died. And because he never died, he was then free to come back. And so people were waiting for Elijah to return. In fact, at the, at the, at 
the Passover meal, there is a place set for Elijah. The door is unlocked and a place is set. In case this is the time and this is the place, Elijah returns. It was probably Elijah's cup that Jesus took at the Last Supper and said, drink all of this, all of you. And so we're expecting the prophet that didn't die to come back. But wait, here's a prophet that death couldn't win over also. And so maybe, just like we were hoping Elijah might come back, maybe Jesus will too. Or instead of, maybe it's Jesus who will come back. And so they were wondering, if death by brutal torture didn't put an end to Jesus, maybe anything's possible. He was a carpenter, maybe he'll come back and build a house. Maybe he'll live in our neighborhood. Wouldn't that be great? Maybe Jesus would return in bodily form to lead us through the challenges of life. And so stories started circulating about Jesus' pending, even imminent return. Now let's skip ahead, that's year 29 and moving forward. Now we have gone forward 22 years. It is now the year 51 of the Common Era. 22 years have gone by since Jesus' execution. For 22 years we have been hearing and sharing stories about him not staying dead and about his imminent return. But it's been a couple of decades if it's going to be imminent, it better happen pretty much now. But you know what else? In the last 22 years, since 29, we've lost some people. 22 years is a long time. Some of those people back in 29, they weren't young then. There's been some plagues uh, sweep through since then. There's been some crime waves. There have been wars. You know, th there have been accidents. Th there have been things that have happened. So we don't have all of those people with us anymore. A lot of people who were following Jesus even after his execution and who were hoping and waiting for his return, a lot of them have died. And so even if he comes back today, our departed loved ones will have missed it. They believed and hoped and worked and waited, but they'll miss his grand, grand finale. And the Apostle Paul hears this anxiety and he wants to comfort it. Just like the story of he didn't stay dead was empowering and encouraging, and the story he might come back was empowering and encouraging, now Paul is hearing, but now we're worried that those who didn't live long enough, that they have missed out on the blessing. And Paul addresses it when he writes to a group in Thessalonica in the year 51. And so from that letter to the Thessalonians, that's the reading we heard uh, Deacon Ed read today. And in that letter, the oldest uh, scripture in the New Testament, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians before even the Gospels are written. And so in the year 51, he writes to the Thessalonians telling them that the departed won't miss a thing. Just like killing Jesus didn't, didn't work, it didn't take. And just like uh, we have been hoping he might return, well, now it's taken longer than we thought. And so there are people who preceded us in death, but they don't get left out. The story keeps adapting to meet the needs. That's what makes it sacred. It isn't, the story doesn't become an idol that we worship. The story continues to expand and grow to meet our needs. And so Paul has figured out how to make the story grow, how to expand the story to include more people. He is now even including the people who are no longer with us. The dead in Christ will be raised first. Not only do they not get left out, they may get preferential treatment. Not only do they get to go, they're the ones going first class. We're in coach. And so, if they have died while waiting, that's in our time. They will not be forgotten. The return of Christ, whatever that is and however it shows up, will include our departed loved ones. Heck, they may even be first. So says the Apostle Paul. Then, Paul says, then those of us who are still here those of us who are still waiting, then we will experience the miracle too. No one gets left out. And even those who died waiting, they are included and they get the best seats. And then he tells the point of the whole thing with these final words. Encourage one another with these words. That's the point. 
That's the point. The point isn't some theological doctrine to argue about. The point isn't who's in and who's out. The point isn't who's right and who's wrong. The point isn't can you take this story literally or not. The point is think of ways to encourage one another. Times are hard. How can our faith get us through it and help us dream and work toward better days? That's the point. Encourage one another with your words. When we all focus on lifting one another up, Things seem to get better. Believe better days are possible. Dare to believe that somehow God is working through your pain to bring forth blessings. Be encouraged by the vision, Paul says. Now, did Paul really believe that Jesus was literally going to return and that he was going to do so in his lifetime? Or was the return for him more symbolic? Maybe Paul thought that the Christ community was the return, that the church was the resurrected and returned body of Christ, called to continue the Christ mission. But either way, whether, his, whether the image that he put forth, whether he thought he was telling it uh, as facts, or whether he was being creative and inviting people into, uh, in, into life-giving imaginings, either way, whether it was symbolic or literal for him, and whether we take his words symbolically or literal, either way, the departed and the living, the all people would be included in God's grace. The dead would not be forgotten and the living could still be guided and sustained by hope. Use the story not to divide, not to conquer, not to beat up, not to shame, not to blame, not to frighten, but to encourage. We'll be enraptured. We'll be caught up in the clouds of hope and celebration when we encourage one another. Now, good for Paul being all uh, encouraging and motivational speaker about it. But there is no shortage of those who will tell you that your dream, your vision, your effort, your sacrifice, your hard work, your contribution just isn't enough. Thanks for all you did, if only you'd done it better. Thanks for all you did. Do it again sometime, but next time, do it good. And we, we'll hear that always. Uh, or, well, God love you. You're, you're always one to try, aren't you? Bless your heart. There are those who can't wait to tell us what's wrong with our effort. But those, those balloon-busting criticisms are from people who are desperately afraid that they aren't good enough. And so how they cope with their own feelings of not enoughness is by trying to smear other people's efforts. And when you think of those people, someone came to your mind, I saw it, boom, 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 we saw someone. <laughs> I hope at least peripherally you caught a reflection of yourself too. Because we've all done it. We've all been not our best selves now and again. Now some of us make it a lifelong habit, but all of us have those moments where we were not our best selves. But I promise you, we can become, it's never too late, we can become encouragers rather than snipers. We can celebrate what's good and encourage one another through the truly trying times. We will slip into old habits sometimes, but we can also make course corrections. We can learn to be encouragers rather than balloon poppers. And sometimes, faith comes by hearing. And the one sure way to hear something good is to say it to ourselves. Sometimes we have to encourage ourselves. I love the story about two little girls. It was Dennis and Tito. It was uh, about two, no, I don't know. About two little girls, and they were in a room, in a playroom, and inexplicably, inexplicably, strangely, uh, the uh, room was knee deep in horse poop. Just a room. And of course they weren't uh, being properly supervised because who would let them go into a room full of horse poop? But there they were, two children, room full to the knee of horse poop. Well, one of the little kids, we'll say Dennis, uh, was disgusted by it and could only complain about how gross and stinky and messy the horse poop was. But the other kid, Tito, Tito, is, <laughs> Tito dives into it. Tito, he's not where, like he's now waist deep and he's playing in it. And Dennis says to him, Tito, what are you doing? And he says, there's gotta be a pony here somewhere. <laughs> Some of us won't rest until we find gecko poop in the corner. 
but others of us could face a mountain of horse hockey and take it as a sign that a mighty steed must be nearby. Pony poop is messy and stinky, but it's also proof that there's a pony. Encouragement can help us endure the poop and find the pony. We can choose to encourage ourselves and one another. There's a pony somewhere. The healers and the heroes of the world are encouragers. Encouragers are life changers and world changers. The healers and heroes who faced the onslaught of AIDS encouraged us to be vocal, encouraged us to work for government funding for research, encouraged us to learn how to be safer, encouraged us to take care of one another as people were getting sick, encouraged us to remember those who had fallen, encouraged us to believe that breakthroughs would happen one day. Lots of experimental drugs and complementary therapies came and went. Some were promising, some were useless. But we were encouraged to try everything. We were encouraged to dream of better days, to not give up the fight, to not forget the fallen, and to support one another as best we could. The cure hasn't shown up yet. We've been waiting for a miracle for decades. It hasn't shown up yet. And yet believing that it could, believing that it might, and not giving up hope has led us to experience multiple other miracles along the way. The cure hasn't shown up yet. It's not, it hasn't descended from the clouds yet. And yet the narrative, the story of don't give up hope, the story of encourage one another, the story of the dream of better days has sustained us and we have experienced many better days. Words of encouragement got us through that very troubling time. Encouragement lifted us up when we felt beaten down. The Christian faith isn't afterlife fire insurance. It isn't a genie in a bottle that grants every wish. It isn't an argument against science. It isn't a long list of things you should never enjoy. And it isn't reason to feel shame about yourself. The Christian faith has always been the testimony that love can't be killed, that hope crushed can be resurrected, and that the faith community can be a well of encouragement. Whether we take our sacred stories literally or not, we are meant to use them in encouraging ways. And so whatever you are facing in life, I want to encourage you today. You can be lifted up. Your hopes can be resurrected. And the return of a peace that passes understanding could happen today. And this is the good news. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.